Hi, welcome to Multicultural Children's Book Day. Your youth librarians, Allison, Amy, Hillary, and Andrea, want to share some of their favorite multicultural children's books. Most were published in 2020, a few are older, and all have appeal for a broad range of ages. It was hard to narrow down the choices from all the wonderful books that were available. So, please, after you have read these, find a link to our curated Pinterest boards at lopl.org for more great titles that elevate race, identity, and ability. Our Favorite Day of the Year by A.E. Ali, illustrated by Rahela Jampur Bell. On the first day of kindergarten, Musa finds himself seated at a table with three other children. Their teacher, Ms. Gupta, explains that by the end of the year, they will be good friends, and one way they will all get to know each other is by sharing show and tell of their favorite days of the year. Ms. Gupta's favorite day is the first day of school. Musa's favorite day is the Muslim holiday at the end of Ramadan, Eid al-Fitr. When it's his turn for show and tell, Musa's mother comes to class to share the foods, decorations, and traditions associated with Eid. Over time, Musa's classmates share their favorite days too, Rosh Hashanah, La Posadas, and even Pi Day. That's on March 14th. The end of the book features a textured quilt with squares representing different cultural celebrations. This inclusive story turns simple classroom show and tell into an opportunity to share identity and culture in a way that fosters curiosity and generosity. I Am Brown by Ashok Bonker, illustrated by Sanjaya Prabhat. Beginning with the child sporting exuberant puffball pigtails and broadening into a community of brown-skinned children, the figures in this joyful picture book love the skin they're in. The figures portrayed in many modes of dress know that they exemplify love and friendship, that they can become anything and do anything. Of special interest are spreads that show the diversity of figures' experiences through foods eaten, activities enjoyed, and homes lived in. In one, children gather around a globe, pointing out continents where they come from, languages they speak, and places they pray. This message of normalcy and joy of being brown is upbeat and uplifting. I Am Every Good Thing, written by Derek Barnes, illustrated by Gordon C. James. I am a non-stop ball of energy, powerful and full of light. I am a go-getter a difference maker, a leader. Page after page of empowering text like this speaks to energetic children everywhere as the author illustrator team behind Crown, an ode to the fresh cut, returns with another fabulous celebration of black boys. Different speakers energetically declare their competence at science and sports, as well as their creativity and perseverance. The speaker admits he is sometimes afraid of what others call him, but refuses to let those attitudes define him. The vibrant illustrations reinforce the energy as groups and individuals share their gifts with the world. Remembering their ancestors and their fathers and acknowledging their own strengths, a line of boys gaze at the reader before the book's final declaration I am worthy to be loved. Eyes That Kiss in the Corner, written by Joanna Ho, illustrated by Dung Ho. A young Asian girl notices that her eyes look different from those of her peers. They have big round eyes and long lashes. She realizes that her eyes are like her mother's, her grandmother's, and her little sister's. They have eyes that kiss in the corners and glow like warm tea, crinkle into crescent moons, and are filled with stories of the past and hope for the future. Drawing from the strength of these powerful women in her life, she recognizes her own beauty and discovers a path to self-love and empowerment. This powerful poetic picture book will resonate with readers of all ages. 
Here's an incredibly powerful picture book that is so vibrant and beautiful, the colors of Molly Mendoza's illustrations burst from the page. Freedom We Sing by Amira Leon is a lyrical picture book designed to inspire and give hope. The author is a poet and a singer-songwriter and has crafted this book around a poem about what it means to be free. It's slow and contemplative, allowing several moments for the reader to stop, inhale, and exhale. It's lush, it's immersive, and its message is so hopeful and timely for this tense historical moment we are living in. It will definitely be a conversation starter for kids and their grown-ups. Evelyn Del Rey and Daniela are best friends in the whole world. They're both Latinx, they do everything together, and even live in twin apartments across the street from each other. Daniela with her mommy and hamster, and Evelyn with her mommy, poppy, and cat. But the worst thing is happening. Daniela's numero uno best friend, Evelyn, is moving away. Leading up to the big move, the girls play amid the moving boxes until it's time to say goodbye, making promises to keep in touch because they know that their friendship will always be special. The tenderness of Meg Medina's beautifully written story about friendship and change is balanced by Sonia Sanchez's colorful and vibrant depictions of the girls' neighborhood in Evelyn Del Rey is Moving Away. I am darn tough. Written by Licia Morelli and illustrated by Maine Diaz. Kids can become stronger and more resilient simply by realizing how strong and resilient they already are. Refusing to quit, overcoming weariness, skinned knees, and self-doubt to finish a cross-country run, the resolute narrator of I Am Darn Tough realizes that she is stronger than she thought inside and out. The story shows how to keep going even when something is difficult. It is a beautifully illustrated narrative that can inspire any child anytime who wants to move toward greater confidence in her or himself. Sadiq Wants to Stitch by Mamta Naini, illustrated by Nilfer Vadia. In this book that looks at gender stereotyping from a male perspective, young Sadiq loves to stitch, like his mother does. But in his Indian community in the mountainous region of Kashmir, only women and girls embroider beautiful patterns on rugs, while men and boys tend to their sheep and goats. So Sadiq stitches in secret during the night. When his mother falls ill, and is unable to complete a commission, Sadiq surprises her with a beautiful rug he embroidered. With pride in her son, she reverses her attitude to support his needlework ambitions. Colorful watercolor illustrations show expansive landscapes, vibrant embroidered rugs, and Muslim Bakarwal people wearing traditional clothes and headgear. All the way to the top, How One Girl's Fight for Americans with Disabilities Changed Everything, written by Annette Bay Pimitel, forwarded by Jennifer Keelan Chaffins, and illustrated by Ollie H. Nabium. Jennifer Keelan, born with cerebral palsy, was unable to attend her local school because steps created a barrier for her wheelchair. Her family joined the disability rights movement in 1987 in Phoenix, where she first told her story publicly. Over the next few years, the Keelans traveled to other cities for demonstrations. In 1990, when the Americans with Disabilities Act, known as ADA, was languishing in Congress, activists gathered before the U.S. Capitol to demonstrate. Determined to represent kids with disabilities in the protest, remembered as the Capitol Crawl, nine-year-old Jennifer joined others who, unable to walk unassisted, slowly hauled, heaved, and dragged themselves up the building's 100 steps. The ADA soon passed. Still an activist, Jennifer Keelan Chaffins offers a thought-provoking forward to this inspiring picture book. I Talk Like a River by Jordan Scott and illustrated by Sydney Smith. In this moving, deeply personal account, I Talk Like a River explains how one boy navigates a bad speech day with the help of his father and a visit to a favorite place. The boy wakes each morning with the sounds of words all around, but some are too difficult to say. One especially unbearable day, his teacher insists that he answer a question. The child's classmate watches lips 
twist and twirl, their mouths giggling and laughing while he tries to speak. Fortunately, after school, his dad suggests a trip to the river, a river that moves the way the boy speaks, bubbling, churning, whirling, and crashing before it finds its smooth and glistening calm after the rapids. The boy finds comfort here because just like him, even the river stutters. By tying the experience of stuttering to nature, award-winning poet Jordan Scott, who is a stutterer, skillfully allows the protagonist to feel part of a grand design and the hurt caused by a mouth that isn't working is put into perspective. Sydney Smith's beautiful watercolor ink and gouache art illuminates what is written and what lies beneath. When We Are Kind by Monique Gray Smith and illustrated by Nicole Needhart. When We Are Kind celebrates simple acts of everyday kindness and encourages children to explore how they feel when they initiate and receive acts of kindness in their lives. Celebrated author Monique Gray Smith communicates an important message through carefully chosen words for readers of all ages. Beautifully illustrated by artist Nicole Needhart, the pictures notably center on indigenous families and characters of color in personal and communal activities. Visually appealing at every turn, the book offers up details in clothing and surroundings. The words inspire questions and memories about being kind with family and friends, encouraging readers to evaluate their actions toward others. Thanks to the Animals by Alan Sockabasin, illustrated by Rebecca Ray. Little Zoo Sap and his family are moving from their summer home on the Maine coast to the deep woods for the winter, traveling on a huge bobsled pulled by horses through the snow. When the baby falls off the sled unnoticed, the forest animals hear his cries. First to come are the beaver, who put their tails together to cradle him. Then all the other animals circle round everyone, from the tiny mouse to the giant moose to the great bald eagle, keeping him safe and warm until his father comes back to find him. This story is an example of both the subtle directness and the deep awareness of our relation to the natural world that characterizes American Indian traditional storytelling. Saka Basin, a Passamaquoddy tribal leader, musician, and preserver of the language, uses a voice both gentle and strong. His story gives readers a true picture of the native way of seeing, teaching, and understanding. Sumo Joe, written by Mia Wenjen and illustrated by Nat Awada. Friendly sibling rivalry sparks a face-off between the two Japanese, Japanese martial arts forms, Sumo and Aikido. Japanese-American Sumo Joe, spelt with an E, is strong, gentle, and built for Sumo, while his sister Joe, spelt without an E, must go to Aikido. When Joe's friends arrive to practice Sumo, his two friends are quick to help tie the special belt and construct their makeshift wrestling ring with various throw pillows. His sister Joe is tenacious in challenging her brother despite the traditional sumo practice that women cannot enter the ring once it is purified. When Sumo Joe accepts, readers are treated to a lively sibling duel with a good-natured conclusion. An author's note and glossary also provide extended cultural notes on both martial or arts forms including Sumo's Origins in Shinto. Lolly's Feather by Farhana Zia, illustrated by Stephanie Pfizer Coleman. This endearing story of identification and values demonstrates the reward of looking closely and thinking imaginatively at all things. Lolly finds a little feather in the field. Could it be lost? She sets out to find Feather a home, but one bird after another rejects it. The feather is too small for rooster, too slow for crow, and too plain for peacock. Once Lolly decides to keep the little feather and discovers all the things she can do with it, the other birds begin to recognize its value. Zia's charming tale employs a circular structure that reveals the importance of looking beyond first impressions. The musicality of the prose, dotted with Hindi expressions, lends a folkloric tone to this whimsical tale. 
and a striking art contrasts the warm, bright colors of silks and spices with the lush turquoise of peacock feathers. Efren feels like his mother is superwoman. Both Ama and Apa work hard all day to provide for the family, making sure Efren and his twin kindergarten-aged siblings, Max and Mia, feel safe and loved. But Efren worries about his parents. They are undocumented. His worst nightmare comes true one day when Ama does not return from work and is deported to Mexico. Now Efren has to take care of the house and the twins while his father works, all while trying to figure out a way to get Ama back home where she belongs. Efren Divided by Ernesto Cisneros is a tender, heartfelt, own voices picture of a lost childhood as families are separated due to immigration issues. It's been a hard year for Maisie ever since she hurt her leg and could not keep up with her ballet training and auditions. Her blended Seattle family is loving and supportive, but Maisie knows that they just can't understand how hopeless she feels. During a family trip to the Olympic Peninsula to explore more of Maisie's macaw heritage, Maisie's stepfather, Jack, shares a bit of history about the contact between the Duwamish people and early colonizers. When Maisie tells him she doesn't know what he's talking about, he asks, what the heck kind of history are they teaching you in school then? She replies, the Treaty of Paris. The Sea in Winter by Christine Day has created a contemplative own voices novel that organically explores Maisie's grief and identity, both as a dancer and as a Native American. All He Knew by Helen Frost. Henry has been deaf from an early age. He is intelligent and aware of language, but by age six, he has decided it's not safe to speak to strangers. When the time comes for him to start school, he is labeled unteachable. Because his family has very little money, his parents and older sister Molly feel powerless to help him. Henry is sent to Riverview, a bleak institution where he is misunderstood, underestimated, and harshly treated. Victor, a conscientious objector, or CO, to World War II, is part of a civilian public service program offered as an alternative to the draft. In 1942, he arrives at Riverview to serve as an attendant and quickly sees that Henry is far from unteachable. He is brave, he is clever, and sometimes mischievous. In Victor's care and with the gift of a pad of paper and pencil, Henry begins to see how things can change for the better. In Helen Frost's Expert Hands, the historical richness and glimpses of the cruelty and abuse so common in the institutions of the era is heartbreaking and ultimately hopeful, providing sharp insight into a little known element of history. As the only Indian American kid in a small suburb of Detroit, Leka feels like she has to live two different versions of herself. Home Leka, who loves watching Bollywood movies and eating Indian food, and school Leka, who pins her hair over her bindi birthmark and avoids confrontation at all cost, especially when she gets teased for being Indian. When a new girl moves in across the street, Leka is excited to learn that she's Desi too. Finally, there will be somebody else around who gets it. But as soon as Avantika speaks, Leka hears her accent and finds out that she's actually brand new to this country. Avantika turns out to be so different from Leka. She doesn't take the bullying quietly, and she proudly displays her culture at school. When a racist incident rocks Leka's community, Leka realizes she must make a choice with the help of her new friend. Continue to remain silent or find her voice before it's too late. American as Paneer Pie by Supriya Kelkar is going to be great for fans of realistic fiction featuring girls who navigate difficult friendships to find their voices and learn how to stand up for themselves. The Great Up Ending by Beth Kephart. 12 year old Sarah and her brother Hawk are told that they are not to bother the man, the mister, who just moved into the silo apartment on their farm. It doesn't matter that they know nothing about him and they think they ought to know something. It doesn't matter that he's always riding that unicycle around. Mama told them no way, no how are they to bother the mister unless they want to be in a mess of trouble. Now Sarah is a wordsmith. Although she's overly tall, has a weak heart and has poor sight, all due to a condition called Marfan syndrome. She's sensitive to the world around her. She's especially loyal to her brother Hawk and his belief that the mysterious Mr. renting their parents' renovated silo holds the key to some sort of good fortune. 
It's a fortune the Scholl family needs because, as Sarah notes, quote, farms are full of losing fruit to flies, seeds to breeze, chicks to coons, fences to time, crops to drought, end quote. Sarah can feel the weight of her family's worry and the weight of her time running out. But what can a pair of kids do? Well, it all starts with bothering the mister and a reward and a trip to New York City and a few plot twists along the way. Hurricane Season by Nicole Mellaby. For Fig's dad, hurricane season brings the music. For Fig, hurricane season brings the possibility of disaster. Fig is a sixth grader who loves her dad and the home they share in a beachside town. She does not love the long months of hurricane season. Her father, a once renowned piano player, sometimes goes looking for the music in the middle of a storm. Hurricane months bring unpredictable good and bad days. Afraid of being taken from her father and intensely private about his struggles, Fig must enlist the help of their new neighbor, Mark, when her dad wanders off in the middle of a fierce hurricane. Hoping to better understand her father, STEM-inclined Fig starts a project about artist Vincent van Gogh and becomes drawn to similarities between her family and his. Through the class, Fig meets three people who guide her to a deeper understanding of herself, a supportive art teacher, a boy who genuinely wants to be Fig's friend, and Hannah, a high school student on whom Fig develops a crush. Their neighbor, Mark's steadfast presence and growing relationship with her dad, first infuriates Fig, then allows her to relinquish her fierce protection of her father. As hurricane season advances, she becomes less anxious and more comfortable in her life. Hurricane Season is a radiant and tender novel about taking risks and facing danger, about friendship and art, and about growing up and coming out. And more than anything else, it is a story about love, both its limits and its incredible healing power. Show Me a Sign by Anne Claire Lizotte. Free-spirited, inquisitive, 11-year-old Mary Lambert loves to spin stories. She's also deaf, as are her father and many others on Martha's Vineyard in 1805. No one knows why the island has such a high population of deaf people. Signing is the only language Mary has ever known, and her life is full. Learning that a scientist is coming to the island to study why there are so many deaf residents sparks Mary's curiosity. He charms her mother and many others on the island, but Mary soon discovers his intentions are malicious. She is kidnapped from her home and becomes his live specimen for scientific study. Her struggle to regain control of her life in a world where the deaf are considered moronic and her determination to find a way home will take all of her strength, cunning, and courage. Lizotte, herself deaf, crafts a moving tale that highlights issues still relevant more than 200 years later, including racism, ableism, and prejudice. At the front of a middle school classroom in Oklahoma, a boy named Kosra, who everyone calls Daniel, stands trying to tell a story, his story, but no one believes a word he says. To them, he's a dark-skinned, hairy-armed boy with a big butt whose lunch smells funny, who makes things up and talks about poop too much. But his stories, stretching back years and decades and centuries, are beautiful and terrifying. From the moment his family fled Iran in the middle of the night with the secret police moments behind them, back and back to the sad cement refugee camps of Italy, and even further back through his family's history. Everything Sad is Untrue, a True Story, by Daniel Nairi, is just that. A true story, a memoir. This book made me laugh out loud at parts and cry at others. It's a must-read for tweens, teens, and adults alike. Things Seen From Above by Shelley Pearsall When sixth grader April Boxler volunteers to spend time on the school playground's buddy bench, she doesn't expect it to change the way she sees everything. In fact, she only agreed to spend recess with the fourth graders to avoid dealing with her own changing friendships. But it's on the bench where April first watches fourth grader Joey Bird 
walking in what seems to be deliberate patterns. Thanks to the help of the kind school janitor, Mr. Ulysses, April is able to get a bird's-eye view of Joey's playground designs. She begins to recognize the quiet boy's unique perspective. Joey is clearly neuroatypical, though never diagnosed in the book. Does it matter? The guidance counselor asks when April wonders whether he's on the autism spectrum. The buddy bench also turns out to be a place for April to make a new friend, Veena, a new student from India. Together, April and Veena try to understand Joey, who would prefer to be left alone with his tracings. As more attention is drawn to Joey's talent, his private world is disrupted and April learns that actions have consequences. April also begins to consider viewpoints other than her own, a sign of her growing empathy. As Mr. Ulysses tells her, I came to the conclusion a long time ago that people often see only what they expect to see. If they don't expect much, they don't see much. April's social struggles are authentic, and the intergrade dynamics of elementary school ring true. Readers will think about this novel long after they've closed the book. It's full of heart and is sure to encourage looking at the world through a new lens. In Manana Land by Pam Munoz Ryan, 11 year old Maximiliano is ready for the perfect summer. However, when the rules of the football league change and Max is forced to provide his birth certificate to join the team, his summer plans go down the drain. The document disappeared when he was a baby, along with his mother. He longs to know more about her, but Papa won't talk. So when Max uncovers a buried family secret involving an underground network of guardians who lead people fleeing a neighboring country to safety, he decides to seek answers on his own. With a treasured compass, a mysterious stone rubbing, and a family legend as his only guides, he sets out on a perilous quest to discover what the future holds. Pam Munoz Ryan weaves some folklore and magical elements into this story, which is set in the fictional country of Santa Maria, though the struggles of real refugee immigrants and the compassion of those who protect the travelers ring true. Land of Cranes by Ida Salazar. Nine-year-old Betita knows she is a crane, Poppy has told her over and over again the Aztec legend that their people would one day return to live among the cranes in their promised land. Poppy tells Batita that they are cranes that have come home. The perceptive, compassionate voice of fourth grader Batita Quintero is perfectly embodied in Salazar's free verse. Set in 2018, Petita lives in modest circumstances in East Los Angeles with her loving, hardworking mommy and poppy, learning from an inspiring teacher, Ms. Martinez, how to create daily picture poems to paint her feelings. The Quintero's hopes that the sanctuary state will provide safety are dashed with an ice raid at Poppy's work site. When Betita and Mommy travel to visit him at the Tijuana border, a missed turn takes them into Mexico and detainment in a big, frozen, concrete monster, where they huddle with other women and children under mylar capes in chain link cells and are mocked by the guards. Even in cruel and inhumane conditions, Betita finds heart in her own poetry and in the community she and her mother find in the camp. The voices of her fellow asylum seekers fly above the hatred keeping them caged, but each day threatens to tear them down lower than they ever thought they could be. Will Betita and her family ever be whole again? Betita's faith in the story Poppy tells, that one day our people would return to Aztlan, the land of the cranes, the U.S. Southwest, sustains her as the picture poems she creates become both solace and a source of important documentation. Salazar's lyrical verse fashions empowerment out of indignity and suffering, creating a stirring and accessible, all too timely story. Ways to Make Sunshine by Renee Watson. This book is a first installment in a contemporary, realistic African-American middle grade series. Ryan Hart's family must relocate to another part of Portland, Oregon because her dad isn't making as much money as he once did. Ryan is a young girl, confident in her gifts. She especially loves to cook. She is also capable of standing up for herself, particularly when she is teased for having a name more commonly given to boys. As she has a li and she has a lively imagination, Ryan and her best friend Kiki get creative when the Grand Floral Parade gets rained out and prepare for this 
school talent show together. The theme of loving family and friends, even through difficult times, will resonate with readers. Junk Boy by Tony Abbott. This is an intense story in free form verse about an unlikely but desperately needed friendship between two outsiders, both teens. Wretched circumstances are the backdrop as the two main characters prove that people can help others even as they contend with their own demons. At once action-oriented and introspective, the novel in verse has a male point of view and would be a good read-alike for those who enjoy Jason Reynolds' Long Way Down. Crushing socioeconomic status and homophobia are both issues in this challenging and ultimately empowering tale. Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. At nearly 17, Camina Rios lives in the Dominican Republic with her aunt, where she dreams of attending medical school at Columbia University near her father, whom she only sees a few months each year. Skilled chess player Yahara Rios, 16, lives with her Dominican parents in New York City next to her girlfriend, Dre. When Yahara's fa father leaves for his annual summer trip to the Dominican Republic, the plane crashes, leaving no survivors, and upending the lives of Yahara and his other daughter, Camino. In the months following the crash, the girls, previously unknown to each other, discover their sisterhood and their father's double life and must come to terms with difficult truths about their parents. We Are Not Free by Tracy Chi. The author uses her own San Francisco-based Japanese-American family's history to inform a timely indictment of the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Beginning in March 1942, three months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 14 young people, all but one from San Francisco's Japantown, chronicle in interlinked stories their lives over the course of the next three years. Their first person, present tense narratives depict thoughts, feelings, and experiences, particularly regarding the unjust treatment of Japanese American citizens before, during, and after incarceration in internment camps. It is a heart-wrenching book. Included in the book are various graphic elements that connect the story to its historical period, drawings, photographs, maps, postcards, telegrams, and newspaper articles. The term apple is a slur in native communities across the country. It's for someone supposedly red on the outside, white on the inside. Eric Gansworth tells his own story in Apple, Skin to the Core. The story of his family of Onondaga among Tuscaroras, of native folks everywhere. His own story spans from the horrible legacy that the government boarding schools left to his parents and grandparents, to his experiences as a boy watching his siblings leave and return and leave again, to a young man fighting to be an artist. In this memoir in verse, Gansworth shatters that slur and reclaims it in heartbreaking verse and prose with paintings, photographs, and collages interspersed throughout. This is a must read for teens and adults alike. Not so pure and simple by Lamar Giles. High schooler Dell has had a crush on Kira since kindergarten, but Kira has never been single. Sud when she suddenly experiences a breakup, he's determined to give things a go, inadvertently signing up for their church's purity pledge group alongside her. Though he's a virgin, Dell has a reputation for being a player at school, and Kira won't entertain his clumsy advances. Meanwhile, Dell navigates being the guy who has to ask awkward questions in the sex ed class that other purity pledgers aren't allowed to take. With true-to-life characters and a straightforward handling of sex, including often ignored aspects of male sexuality, Giles' thoughtful, hilarious read offers a timely viewpoint on religion, toxic masculinity, and teen sexuality. In the Henna Wars by Adiba Jai Girdar, Bangladeshi Irish teen Nishat is tired of hiding the fact that she is a lesbian. But when she comes out to her parents, they respond with cold silence. Devastated, Nishat struggles to cope by focusing on winning the school's business competition and by trying to ignore her romantic feelings for Flavia, a new biracial black Brazilian white Irish girl at her school. Nishat's business venture offers mendi, or henna tattoos, a traditional Bangladeshi art form that Nishat learned from her grandmother. Nishat is thrilled about showcasing her culture until Flavia decides to do a henna business as well, a choice that Nishat feels smacks of cultural appropriation. Now she's competing with her crush. 
With her super supportive sister by her side, Nishat fights to be her truest, most visible self. Tweens and teens will find lots to resonate with in this story whose issues of intersectional race and sexuality are wrought with heart and humor. This is My America by Kim Johnson. This is the story of Tracy Beaumont, a 17-year-old black girl who is fighting relentlessly to free her father, who was wrongfully accused of murder and sentenced to death. She has less than a year to prove her, his innocence using her skills as an emerging journalist, and with the help of innocent ex, she needs to free her father and figure out if his case is connected to recent crimes that have been plaguing her small Texas town. Johnson's debut draws on her own experiences as an activist to offer a realistic depiction of reckoning with the complex and too often fatal issues that plague black Americans today. Sky Shin has heard it all. Fat girls shouldn't dance, wear bright colors, shouldn't call attention to themselves. But Sky dreams of joining the glittering world of K-pop, and to do that, she's about to break all the rules that society has set for girls like her. She enters an internationally televised competition looking for the next K-pop star, and she vows to do it better than anyone else. When Sky nails her audition, she's immediately swept into a whirlwind of countless practices, shocking performances, and the drama that comes with reality TV. What she doesn't count on are the highly fatphobic beauty standards of the Korean pop entertainment industry, her sudden media fame and scrutiny, or the sparks that soon fly with a hunky competitor, Henry Cho. But Sky has her sights set on becoming the world's first plus-size K-pop star, and that means winning the competition without losing herself. Fans of Julie Murphy, David Yoon, and Becky Albertalli will love I'll Be the One by Lila Lee. We Are Not From Here by Jenny Torres Sanchez. Pequeña, Bolga, and Chico are three teens who flee their Guatemalan town out of fear for their lives. They know they must find a way to the United States, but first they need to conquer La Bestia, the name given by migrants to the train that claims the limbs and lives of many who flee violence. Sanchez's insightful descriptions of the characters' thoughts and feelings, as well as their desperation, will elicit empathy from readers. We Are Not From Here is a candid, realistic story that will leave readers thinking about the characters and the state of our, of our world long after putting the book down. Parachutes by Kelly Yang Claire is a parachute, a wealthy teen from Shanghai whose parents sent her to America for a foreign education. Danny, a scholarship student, works after school cleaning the homes of her wealthy classmates to help her mom make ends meet. Although Danny and Claire share a home, as host and boarder, they exist in separate social orbits. They both struggle with a wide range of issues ranging from inappropriate teacher relationships, rape, cheating, race, class and power discrepancy. Yang creates a delicate balance between these heavier issues and the lighter moments of high school, ending the story with a hopeful and powerful tone. <laughs>